Hi, everybody. <laughs> Happy March. Welcome to this month's episode of Ballpark Figures with Shakia Taylor. I'm Shakia. Um, I am a sports and culture writer at the Chicago Tribune. Uh, this month's guests are Jake Mintz and Jordan Schusterman. They have been creating baseball internet content together for over a decade. They met at a synagogue in Maryland. I'm sorry, someone is saying my audio is breaking up. Can people let me know if you can hear me? <clears throat> okay, perfect. <clears throat> they met at a synagogue in, Mar in the Maryland DC suburbs and did not like each other at all in middle school before eventually becoming friends in high school because they each like baseball way more than any of their other friends. During their senior year of high school, they started a blog and Twitter called Cespedes Family Barbecue as a tribute to one of their favorite players. Since graduating from college in 2017, they've worked together at MLB.com, The Ringer, and currently write for Fox Sports. They host baseball barbacast on the Sirius XM Podcast Network and also co-host a college baseball podcast for D1Baseball.com. Hi, Jake and Jordan. Hello. We are here. Hey, Jordan. What's going on, guys? It's good to it's good to it's good to be here. We're very very excited to to have the invite, and and I'm very excited for this conversation. So thank you for the invite, Shakia. I'm excited to be talking to you. Actually, um, I feel like I have only spoken to you on Twitter. So being able to put faces, you know, to the fun is actually really cool. Um, Talk to me a little bit about not liking each other, you guys. Like I read this story online, but for people who don't know. Yes, I'll that's go a good a good place to start, I think. Um, because yeah. I did I did want to make sure I included that in the bio because I think it is an important part of the the BBQ origin story. So yes, I mean, as as I mentioned, uh Jake and I, you know, we 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 met at, at synagogue when we were mere whatever, 11, 12 years old. Um, and in middle school, we all, you know, we went to a small private, private Jewish day school. And the reality was, is that we kind of played the same role in a, a middle school of just like, you know, if, you, if you've gone to this, a smaller school, you kind of understand each, each kid at that age kind of was playing, whether it's whatever, whatever you want to call it, class clown, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We were kind of doing the same thing. And so in a smaller, at that age, in a smaller school, you know, you, you, you want your turf to, to be kind of respected and that was not the case uh when Jake Mitz <laughs> showed up in, in seventh grade for 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 me yeah you know you look at the team like a like a major league team who has like five left fielders right <laughs> that's a re that's what we would call a redundancy so <laughs> when school had Jake Mitz and Jordan Schusterman it was a bit of a clash yeah this Jordan is, this is related this is relevant just to timely spring training what is spring training about it's about position battles right and we were, we were really gunning for the same, the same position uh, in middle school, <laughs> in the middle school social hierarchy, and that kind of did not go well. But baseball brought you together. Loving baseball, wanting to talk about baseball brought you together, right? It united the, you weren't enemies, but you weren't friends. Exactly. Yes. And, and, and it, is, it is indicative that baseball would be the thing to bring us together because we really didn't like each other. You know, like it, like it was, there was beef, right? Like there was, it was not good. So for a little bit of context, like I left for high school and then came back. I didn't get kicked mm -hmm. out for the record. I just didn't like the other school I went to. So I, sure. I left and came back. And the day I came back, Jordan switched to a different high school. So we had no overlap in high school. And that day someone posted on Facebook, Jake for Jordan is not a fair trade. We want Jordan back. Like this was, that's how much it ran. Yeah. And so, but Jake was able to overcome that uh, sick Facebook burn and eventually yeah. open up his heart and friendship uh, to me by probably end of sophomore year, junior year. When again, like, I mean, like I mentioned, you know, in the bio, like we were really like, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I like baseball as a kid and for sure, but like the degree to which we were both getting into the game on all facets from the minors up to the big leagues was so much different than the very casual baseball fandom that our other friends at that age were having. And so it was like, well, I want to talk about this with someone. Uh, so it's, I guess it's going to be him. 
how how are the two of you so deeply into your versions of nerdums? Because you're both baseball nerds, but different types. Mm. So how how do you get there? Where that's where's such a good question. From? That's such a good question because it does come from like a different place, right? And I think that all just stems back to I played, Jordan didn't play. You know, and and not to oversimplify that conversation, and I know that conversation has been had. Everyone here at Sabre knows that you turn on a broadcast and the did you play, did you not play conversation is all over. But what it does is it, like, I am super involved now in coaching. You know, I spend three nights a week coaching in New York. And the reason I love coaching is because I love being at the field and talking about the finer points of a game. Whereas Jordan is like a savant and is able to hold all this, like, endless names of high school prospects and college prospects and professional prospects in his brain. And I think part of that stemmed from just how he got interested in the game, really like through the internet, like the internet played a huge role in your love for baseball. And I think the field played a little bit more for me. And I'm not trying to like put a value judgment onto that. I just think that's a bit of a difference there. Yeah. And I also think that that kind of comes out in the way that while I don't blame people for mixing us up all the time or thinking that there's no difference between Jake and Jordan and it's just two friends who happen to be, you know, doing all this stuff together. Like there's a big difference in the, in the kinds of things that we're interested in, in the game. Now we both love it to the degree that obviously we want to be talking still with each other about it basically every day. But yeah, like Jake said, like the kinds of things that interest me and that interest him or, or that drove it at the beginning were different. And now they're probably more aligned because we've worked together for so long. Um, but yeah, like for me, it was more about just like, I just want to learn as much as I possibly can about every possible element of this, every league, every level. Like I just wanted to know more, 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 more. And that's still true. That is still my goal as I am lucky enough to do this for a living is just to keep learning. And, uh, and I, I imagine people in, involved in Saver can, can certainly relate to that uh, to some degree, but, but yeah. And, and that's how we kind of blend those two perspectives as in the things that we create together now. So you all have been basically <clears throat> in a long distance relationship, right? Like for a really long time, are you in the same place now? No, this is this is a great a, another great question because okay. uh because the the beginning was obviously not we lived about 10 minutes away from each other in high school and so we would just meet up and like play catch and just talk ball like that happened all the time right we would hang all the time we went to different colleges uh for four years i went to the college of worcester in ohio jake went to a washington university in st louis and so you know we would see each other maybe every few months but that's when we started our, our first podcast to, as a way to stay in touch and talk about baseball but then after we graduated we were hired by mlb to work together and to work in New York City at a desk next to each other. And so for two years, every day we were going in and sitting at a desk next to each other. And, you know, a lot has changed obviously since COVID and we've moved on to a couple of different places. And now we do not do not live in the same place at all. Um, but there was a run there. It's kind of been an on and off in that sense. But now, you're yes, right. it is definitely. You're right, distance. Jordan. But we lived about as far away from one another as like two people can in New York City. Like we lived an hour and change on the train yes. on like completely okay. different points of the city. And people always ask like, oh, do you guys live together? It's like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. At no point was that ever even a discussion. And like Shakia, <laughs> the way like you comparing it to a long distance relationship is very funny because I was in a long distance relationship for three years and Jordan was in a long distance relationship for four years. Five, yeah. Five years. <laughs> Five years. Yep. And so like we very much are have, are used to having that type of thing in our lives. And obviously <laughs> it's a different dynamic, right? But like, I love Jordan and I like hanging out with him and I would prefer to see him all the time. But it took us a little bit of time, I think, after we moved away from each other at this stage to learn the routine of how to be partners and friends like over Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it, it, it feels like, the magic was there. You just kind of had to go through your your ups and downs and, you know, the things that you go through in a relationship. Like that, That's true. But I would also say that, like, I think the very start of all of this, which was going to two different colleges and getting together on, I don't know if you people remember that this was an app, Skype. I mean, big loser yes. of the pandemic. I mean, huge, huge loser. No one could have, you know, blown the pandemic more than Skype. But like, that is what we recorded all of our original uh, podcasts on. Um, mm -hmm. And and that was the thing that that routine of, of every week 
you know, getting on and, and, and talking for an hour and, and having a guest on like, that was what we used to do. Um, and so now it's obviously very normal for everybody for all the reasons that we, we understand. But I, I have to imagine that that did play a big role in how comfortable we are uh, with it today. So Jake, <clears throat> when you played, were you good? Oh, love this. Another great question. She's on fire. This is like <laughs> Jordan, do you want to answer this or should I? No, please. No, I, I, I right. I'll, 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 I'll check in if I feel like anything is being misrepresented. <laughs> All right. I'll give you the very abridged version. So because as Jordan said, I went to a small Jewish high school. It was not exactly a powerhouse. And when I mentioned earlier that I left that school for high school, that was to go to like a big DC baseball prep school to like mm -hmm. try and be really good. Mm -hmm. And I made it two months before I just hated the thing and left. And so what that meant was when I got to college, I wasn't recruited at all. I was the type of guy I just walked on. I did showcases. I was 145 pounds. I threw 73 miles an hour and I couldn't hit, you know, it's not exactly a profile schools are like jumping out the gym for, you know? And so I get to college. I'm absolutely terrible for three years, just bad. They moved me to the mound. I'm a reliever for three years. My senior year, I got in the gym. I started trying harder. I had a really good coach. And my senior year, I was one of the best closers in Division Three baseball. It was like second team all region. I was something called a Jewish All-American, which is a hilarious real thing that exists. Um, and I had the second lowest ERA in school history, single season. Like it was, you know, a dream season. And then I spent one week playing independent ball. Uh, I did not get into any games. I went to spring training with the Sonoma Stompers, which I'm sure many people here on this call are familiar with. Unrelated to like the Ben and Sam, the only rule is it has to work era of it. I just went uh, and I got absolutely obliterated out there. And I walked into the GM's office and I said, we both know that I'm not supposed to be here. And I flew home to New York and I've lived here ever since. And then I guess... Pitching in a Sunday league in New York in 2017, I tore my UCL and got Tommy John. <laughs> and so I could play catch with my children. And that's where we're at. I see. Wow. Oh, that, that is what that is. Good. Yep. No notes. Any notes? <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> we've we've come all the way forward. We've come from the the friendship starting from dislike and the long distance relationship and Jake being an athlete. Jordan, what's your version of coming into baseball, right? Like, did you play at all? Like, mm -hmm. what'd you do? How'd you get into it? Yeah. So I did, I did play baseball until I was about 12. Um, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I, I love, like I was playing it. And then, yeah, around like age 12, 13, I just stopped being that interested in baseball. Um, which is still a very weird thing to say in retrospect, but it is absolutely what happened. I really liked basketball a lot more. Not that I thought I was going to go into the NBA, but like, I like basketball more. I was watching. Wait, I Jordan, time out, time out, yeah. time out. We got to talk about your jumper quickly. Oh, oh yes. Well, this is, this is uh, sort of related, but sure. Go, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Before Jordan and I became friends, friends, yes. one of like the main notes about him that I would like have remembered is that he shot like remember sean marion would like no, shoot from like over no it was the, I, it wasn't like sean Marion. it was it was michael red michael red was the one who was back here sean marion was here, like the, like you would sean marion was like oh yeah, yeah, like yeah the, he right, was pushing right. it but jordan yeah. would like it was like a soccer throw in like he yeah. would just like shoot like this but you were pretty good for you know yeah like, it was it was working jewish for kid it was working for yeah. me sorry but, go ahead but no it's just it's true i had a very very uh unique form for sure and, uh, but yeah, I just, I just 12, 13, I just not, I stopped being interested in baseball and that is not a good time to stop playing baseball. If you are, have any hope of playing <laughs> baseball again. Um, and so really by the time I tried to start playing baseball again, which was like 15, 16, I played in American Legion for a summer and I was like, Oh, nope, I suck. I, I missed my chance. This is not going to happen. I'm not playing baseball anymore, but at that time, around that time, um, I got super obsessed with Bryce Harper. Uh, it was really a, a very basic. So growing up in the D.C. area, but even before he was drafted by the Nationals in 2010, um, him as a prospect and as this prodigy just 
captivated me in such a way that I just wanted to know everything about him. I wanted to follow him. I wanted to understand why he was different than other prospects and what, what that means to be a prospect and what that means to, you know, come up. And then that made me starting to want to go to minor league games and want to go see Bryce Harper's, you know, minor league pro debut and, and start following prospects and reading baseball prospectus and listening to the up and in podcast and all these things that, made me just slowly start to get obsessed with every level and understand every level. And around the same time, by the end of high school, I got, I got super into the Mariners. A lot of that was Felix Hernandez throwing a perfect game. And that's when I just started reading, you know, look at landing and, and some of those sites. And from there, it was just, it was, you know, just snowballing. And obviously at that point, Jake and I were already starting to make stuff together. And I was, I was on baseball Twitter a little bit before Jake was, um, or better or worse, I should say. But there was like a space I was a little bit more familiar with before we started our account. And I think that also kind of helped motivate me to kind of get in that space and just just start being a part of it and, and meeting people. And and yeah, I, I would say that's that's kind of how it started. It's I Bryce Harper is, is a very important part of that. So yeah. I actually really love the Bryce Harper tidbit. I'll tell you a little Bryce Harper fun fact about me that is not even exactly baseball related. But um, I used to have a couple drinks and tweet about how much I loved his hair. I would like spend entire games like, oh God, his hair isn't even moving. The, the helmet does nothing to his hair. Someone find out what he's doing. What's the process? That's my Bryce Harper moment. Like I was always ready to clock in with a beer mm -hmm. to think about what was happening with this guy's hair. Yeah. Did you come to a conclusion? Like <laughs> never. You, that okay. that's why I brought it up because I feel like this is more your wheelhouse than mine. Like, what was happening with Bryce's hair that it was always on point? So I have an unfortunate answer here. Oh no! Jordan, do you have a theory? I have a theory. Well, I was just gonna say you use hair product a lot more than I do, so I feel like you have a, a much better sense for maybe what is going on. So please enlighten us. That is a great point. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it is hair product. I mean, I think it is some hair product, but I think the main thing is just sweat. I think <laughs> that ball players' hair, they sweat <laughs> on average for longer and more than most other humans do, and their head is almost always covered. Right. And so I would imagine that that kind of creates a certain greenhouse effect uh, in their head that allows hair to have a certain type of, uh, you know, dynamic uh, quaff to it. And I would mm -hmm. imagine that that plus my guess in terms of product would be some sort of mousse plus uh, a wet mousse plus a dry would be my guess, Jordan. Great. Believable. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I have, I have no, no argument. I have no theory. I'm just mystified by it. Um, that's pretty much all it was for me was like, okay, I'm going to tune in, tune in. Cause what's going to happen tonight with the hair, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, he, that's, the thing. And, that, that's the thing about Bryce Harper, right? There are a lot of reasons to tune in. There were a lot of reasons to turn the, the nationals on and watch them. But like, at this time, he was like running into walls and his hat was falling off and he was like whacking his helmet off when he ran, ran like rounded first. And so you were seeing his hair. We were all seeing his hair way more than any other player in baseball, mm -hmm. except for I guess, Jose Ramirez now. <laughs> when he would get on base, he would do this thing where he would just like flip his hair back. Right. Yes, like, yes, yeah. yes. Like very like baseball model guy. Yeah. Like, you know, we were, and it was like, oh, Bryce is the moment, you know? <laughs> and and that's so, the thing, even though the hair is a little more uh, in, in control now, um, he's still that. And so much of what last postseason, I mean, Jake wrote a ton about this, you know, covering the Phillies in person, but like, it was pretty surreal, but also obvious that we got to watch him do this on the biggest stage last year, especially again, like for me, it was been, been following him since not listen. It's not like I was the only person paying attention. Like that's the whole point is that everyone was paying attention to him right. when he was 15, but because of my age at that point, right? Like we're just a couple of years younger than him. Like he was just the perfect guy. And the fact that he was then playing in DC nearby, just the perfect guy to really captivate someone um, into, into really loving baseball again. What was it like for the two of you covering the World Series? You've done it, what, twice now? 
Oh man. Well, <laughs> we've actually been lucky enough to do this. Actually, uh, unfortunately, I did not get to travel for the World Series this past year. Um, okay. But before that, we had been to six in a row, okay. seven. Okay. We we not twenty twenty. Oh. Um, six, 17, 18, 16, not six. Oh, right. The, how are really? you getting 16? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was the craziest one. Cause we, you know, I was going to school in, in St. Louis and Jordan was going to school in Cleveland and MLB was like, do you want to cover the world series at Wrigley? And we were like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean like yeah. that. I remember we, telling my baseball coach, like, Hey, yeah. I'm not going to be at practice on Saturday. I have to go to the world series at Wrigley. We, he was like, we okay. said it, we said it at the time and it is still true seven years later, like literally the hottest ticket in baseball history. And we got to cover it like that, that we knew how lucky yeah. we were from the beginning to get to be a part of that. And so, yeah, I mean, it was 16, 17, 18, Downhill. 19, 21. So I guess five, and then it would have been six. And yes, I know <laughs> someone in the chat saying Worcester is not Cleveland. That is a, that is a Jake Mintz correction. Very I, worthy of, of being made. Very important correction and an absolute miss on my part, considering I've been to both places uh, <laughs> and having walked around Worcester, Ohio, it, it is, is not Cleveland. very much not. Yeah. You can't smell anything. cow fertilizer in, in Cleveland. <laughs> If there's anything an Ohioan is going to do, it's tell you what you got wrong about their location or their That's, food or their oh. sports team. And as I always make fun of, their graphic tees. Have you ever seen more graphic t-shirts? It's, well, it's I mean, I feel like an overabundance. It feels like, I know some cities, you know, Chicago is almost trying to catch up, but you, you got a long way to go before you have. Well, what happened, many. Jordan? Joe Madden went to the 2016 World Series and he walked around Cleveland and he was like, this is what I want to be. <laughs> and so yes. he was like, oh, we got to get so much sense. We need more corny freaking, you know, graphic yes. tees in Chicago. Oh, it's true. It's true. I to be it. fair, Joe Madden gifted me with try not to suck. A thing mm. that I say to people on an almost daily basis, whether they know it or not, sometimes it's just under my breath, muted on a Zoom call. You know, like, just try not to suck. Joe Madden did give us that. Like, I'm not really concerned about the World Series. It didn't happen as far as, That's you know, true. I, never mind. But, yeah. <laughs> but no, so tell me what it was like covering the Phillies, um, Jake. So, yeah, so I was basically, I, I got very fortunate in that I hitched my wagon to the Phillies situation quite early in October. Uh, I was at the last 13 or 14 Phillies games. So games three and four of the DS, all of the CS, all of the World Series. Um, and it was my first experience covering every game of a series. Jordan and I had been to games in previous World Series, but we had never done the entirety of any playoff series, I think. Um, and it was the first time we did it where our job or my job in, in this case was to write every day and like pretend to be a reporter until I realized that I knew how to do the job. Um, because like we said, like our background wasn't in that and our job at Fox now kind of over time became that and is that mm -hmm. now and love doing that now. But like going into a clubhouse every day and like reporting stories out and, you know, X, Y, Z, X, like doing all that stuff. I had never done it before. And I got very fortunate that I was around a group of players in the Phillies with whom I had a lot of previous relationships. And it just took me a second to realize like, oh, that's just journalism. Like I have relationships with these people. I'm going to ask them good questions and then they're going to give me good answers and I'll write interesting stuff. So um, it was certainly an experience I'll never forget. And I will super never forget being in the losing locker room of World Series was something that was my first experience seeing that and will forever be ingrained into my mind. I have two questions now. You can answer them in whichever order you want. Um, I want to hear more about the transition from, you know, being a fun internet writer to a full-fledged journalist without a journalism background. Uh, but I also want to hear about being in the losing locker room. So pick which one of those you want to answer first. I'll, I'll do loser, losing locker room first, and then I'll let Jordan answer the other question. So it's kind of like the last day of like the sixth grade, if you're about to like switch schools or like high school or college graduation, except no one knows that it's going to be that day. 
unless it's game seven. Like, and so you have all these people who have convinced themselves, some of them genuinely, some of them not, that this is the most important group of people they'll ever be around in their whole lives, right? When you're in the World Series trying to win a World Series, you're like, that's my brother. It's like, and then the World Series is over and it's like, oh, well, Noah Syndergaard over there is a free agent and he doesn't actually need to talk to JT Realmuto anymore. And so like, are they actually friends? Who knows? And people are like saying goodbye to each other. And, you know, you can tell, this is maybe a, a an oversimplified way to describe it, but like some people are crying and some people look like they're not affected at all, right? And you, and obviously people express things in different ways, but it, you just learn a lot about, about players in that moment because, you know, baseball players are usually really boring and they're purposefully walled off. And so you don't often get a lot of who they genuinely are, but in a losing world series locker room, the people who are the players who are real people and not robots become real people because of, of what that environment creates or not now pass you the question. <laughs> yeah, of, no, I mean, know, that's our, that's our a pivot good... to uh, our, what was the word we were using earlier? The um, our pivot to legitimacy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, point. Cause right. It's, it's, it's kind of happened quickly. Uh, I mean, I, like I mentioned, I mean, Jake and I have been doing this together for, for 10 years, but like this part is relatively new to be, you know, we're in the BBWAA now and now we have like, whatever, like these are things that even a few years ago would not have seemed that realistic, not necessarily because we didn't think we could do it, but also because it just, didn't seem like that's kind of where we were heading, but I will say that the cool part is that we still get to host a podcast and make a bunch of dumb jokes. Like, I mean, we, we are pretty fortunate in that we have been able to kind of toe that line while also producing work that people will respect and, and appreciate and, and, and hope that, you know, we, so what's been so cool. And, you know, Jake mentions the Phillies is why do we have relationships with people in the game is because we've been doing it for a long time. And because we've been lucky enough to be around the sport and go to minor league games and meet players before they're anything. And so those relationships and kind of everything that we want to take from everything we're allowed to do, because we know how lucky we are to do the jobs that we do is share it with people. Right. And so in that sense, that is in some cases the goal of a journalist I, I i would say i mean you want to you want to tell the story again like you said like we we did not come from journalism backgrounds at all so like we're kind of reverse engineering the thing where it's like how can we take what we are good at and apply it to this field that we have no professional experience in whatsoever and hopefully produce something that is worthwhile and different and valuable and insightful and whatever um because that's the only way that we can kind of make it worth the fact that we get to do this all the time and so uh that that would be my description of it but um it, i think we're still figuring that out it's still very early mm -hmm. i think in in that process i mean you guys know i made the the jump too yeah. and mm -hmm. it I mean, and I'm in a newspaper, so it's completely different than, you know, writing and filing for BP, right? Like I get, we get messages in Slack that are like, hey, print deadline is two hours earlier because we're expecting snow or whatever, or, you know, and I had never been on a beat at all. I wrote features and now occasionally I jump in when, you know, someone on my team needs a day off, has something to do, or maybe, you know, they just want to hang out. Um, so it, it's a transitional thing. So that's why I was curious in like what ways it's different for you. Like, obviously you want to bring the same enthusiasm. You want to still have the same weird ideas because that's why they hire you to be you, but you also change a little bit. So like, what's, what's different? I mean, you have, I'm sure you had maybe some of this too. Like I have a ton of imposter syndrome at first. Mm -hmm. where I was looking around, I was like, look at all these real journalists. And then it, it kind of took me a little bit of time to realize that they were just doing the same thing that I was there to do. And if I just did the job, then I would just be a real journalist, you know? And it, it was kind of that simple for me from like a mental perspective. Um, but yeah, the transition, I've really found it to be graphic and fulfilling from like a professional perspective because I don't want to be a punchline all the time like okay. I want to be a punchline a lot of the time or sometimes but like no one who makes dumb jokes at age 23 is 
gonna get to make the same jokes with the same tone at age 43 and 63. Mm -hmm. There are people in the industry, in the sports media industry, I'm not gonna name names, who who do that. Like there are these 44 year old, usually men like making dumb college age frat jokes. And like, it it plays so weird. And like, Mm -hmm. I was kind of, we had the moment where I was like, I don't wanna be that. Like I need to, we need to find, It wasn't like considered like we need to find something to pivot to, if that makes sense. But like as this opportunity kind of presented itself, it was like, oh, that's like a way where if I'm, you know, 65 years old and like I just write about baseball for a living forever, I would be very happy, you know? And I think that that's kind of dawned on me over the last couple of months, over the last year. It's super important to grow with what you're doing too, right? So I I think it's great that your jokes are growing with you. Um, And with that growth, came Jake, the Little League coach, right, in Harlem. How is that going? I am following via your social media. I am rooting for these little children who I have never met before. I still want a coffee mug. Um, I have don't it right think here. I... <laughs> I'm drinking out of it right now. I love that. Um, I'm all constantly buying merch for places that I don't live and teams that I will never see podcast that I've never listened to just because it looks good um but talk to me about the kids what's that like um it's fun like I was literally on the my monthly board meeting from seven to eight o'clock tonight um it is so much fun I absolutely love it I've been doing it now for almost three years um And now I am on the board of the Little League and I am, my job for the Little League is to, I'm in charge of like um, what I call like coaching curriculum, right? And so we have a lot of very enthusiastic parents and volunteers who want to help and want to participate, but they don't have like an extensive, an extensive playing background, right? And so they don't know, like they are at the field and they're available and they, whatever, but they don't know like how to run a practice or what are certain drill work that you need to do or how should you teach swing mechanics? And so my job is like, for lack of a better term, teach a man to fish, right? Like I am coaching the coaches, how to coach the kids. And then I also coach a 10 U travel team. That's essentially like a lot of the best kids in Harlem little league that we take up to Westchester and play games uh, like higher level games over there. And it's been super fun. And it's really like, made me appreciate the game a lot more because when you're in this and it's your job and it's your livelihood, even us who are like captain fun and, you know, know, Joker McGee, like we get burnt out sometimes. And like, if you go hit fungos to a nine-year-old, you can't be jaded. Like it, you literally cannot be jaded because those kids want to be there so much. And so it's about giving them that opportunity. Um, And then as far as like up here in, in Harlem, like, the fields here are worse because of, you know, decades of parks department racism, which means that when it rains in the spring, we don't have turf. And so the kids who live downtown have turf. So if it rains on like a Saturday morning when we're supposed to play, we cancel games, kids downtown get to play. And then over time that creates a skill gap after years and seasons and games. And so another one of my jobs is to try and help community projects to get a lot of these fields turfed um, which is a sneaky huge deal up here but yeah it's become Jordan knows like it's just become such a fundamental part of my life and I'm very fortunate now that I, I get to be a part of this the community up here seeing like kids you coach on the street when you're walking home from the subway is like it's like the most wholesome you know fulfilling invigorating thing in the world um, I, I like that you mentioned the equity part, right? That so many people in Little League and other, you know, youth sports are trying to work on. Um, I read a quote in something you guys did. I want to say it was you who said it, Jake, but I think, Jordan, you probably share the sentiment. It's that um, you you love the ways in which baseball helps bring you closer to people and people closer to baseball. Um what other ways outside of Little League um, and coaching are you all doing that? That is, 
Yeah. I mean, the thing now is like, we have so many jobs in baseball now, like it's, it's spread out in a lot of different um, platforms and for a lot of different websites and a lot of different mediums. And so I feel like we're constantly kind of shifting uh, the, the exact tone of the exact audience that we're trying to reach and, and what we're trying to do. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, I mean, it's a great question because, you know, we know that it is not always as simple as, let's just make content that people will like. Uh, and so, I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've tried in the past to, to think about other ways to, to kind of engage people and, and, and get people feeling closer. But like, you know, I, I honestly just think that as long as we're making stuff that is accessible and that, that people are relating to, and that does draw people in, in the way that I was once, you know, more drawn into the sport and I feel like we're, we're doing a good job, but I mean, there's always, there's always more, again, like Jake's doing it every, you know, every day, every week when he's, when he's literally, teaching kids how to love the sport actually, you know, it physically do that. Um, but I think it's something that we're always kind of trying to, to figure out how to, how, how we can do it even better. I'll answer the question in kind of two parts when I've explained this, explained it this way a couple of times, but I view like baseball fandom or any fandom is like of a number of concentric circles where like Jordan and I have a problem with like we love this thing so much like we should have other hobbies it would be good for us right and every person is their own little concentric circle of fandom and no level of fandom is better or worse than another level of fandom right it could be someone who has never heard of Clayton Kershaw who loves getting a hot dog at a baseball game it could be someone who you know follows one particular team it could be someone who's obsessed with prospects pulling someone like a rung closer to us to make baseball a bigger and more positive part of their lives, no matter what, what rung I'm pulling you down from to, or to that is like the point of everything, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And then from a coaching perspective, and I see this all the time, like I think so many youth coaches miss the point below the age of 10. Like it doesn't, the skills don't matter as long as you can catch and throw the baseball. It's literally like if you are, are skilled enough to enjoy the basic level of the sport, all I try and do is associate baseball with having a good time. You know what I mean? That's it. That's all it is. And there are so many parents that are like, you got to do this. You got to do it. It's like, actually, you don't. Um, especially in New York where it's like there are three big leaguers from New York City right now. Like I try to tell all the parents, like, I hope I'm wrong. Your kid's not going to make it to the big leagues. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. They're going to go. They're going to have a very successful and happy life. Like they're not playing in the major leagues. Let's make this an important and enjoyable part of their day. That's all mm -hmm. it is. Right. And so those two things, I find them kind of coming together a lot now that I'm coaching and they kind of like my, my real job that pays the bills informs the coaching thing. And then the coaching thing, which is all volunteer kind of informs the real job. And I've, I've, they've made me better at both. I think. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the fun, right? Because that's what you all are about to me. You guys sort of bring baseball joy, a little baseball weird, but <laughs> baseball joy. Um, tell me about, I don't know, the most fun or the weirdest thing that you've done, encountered, story you've told, baseball related. Like, Give me the weird, the like Man. deeply ridiculous. I have one that, that jumps to mind. I mean, we have okay. so many that it's like impossible to choose, but I have one that I've definitely told and before. We, but I want to but, be clear, like when we have these experiences, I will say to Jordan, like I will just say, hey, we are currently doing this absurd thing. <laughs> <laughs> like I will say it out loud to remind us. So you're ourselves. aware of the absurdity. Oh, the we better be. Okay. We better okay. be. Once, once we're and listen, I'm sure there's points over the past, certainly the last few years, like, and I've mentioned it many times during this conversation. We know how lucky we are to get to go to these things and cover these events, whatever. I'm sure there's things that that slip by us that we should not be taking for granted. But to your point, you want to emphasize the weird. I would say most of those happened earlier on when we were doing stuff. When we were road tripping across the country every summer, we saw some some real wacky stuff because it's particularly in the minors when you had a combination of, you know, long before Jake and Jordan were, you know, reputable journalists, uh, we were still getting media passes. And, and this is the thing. If yeah. I don't know how many children are listening to this. 
Yeah, people many. ask us all the time, like, <laughs> how do you, yeah, probably very few, how do you get into this, right? And we always say, go to your local minor league park, because this is a good thing. They will credential anyone, okay? <laughs> the big league team near you will not, not. credential you. They yes. will not, right? Like, th- that's just how it works. But the local team, just make up a website with your name and put baseball <laughs> at the end of it. That's basically that's what it. we did. <laughs> that's so, exactly what we did. Sure, and sure. And you win. We were showing up and saying, oh, we have this, you know, Twitter account with, you know, 7,000 followers. Like, oh, amazing. You guys are great. Okay, whatever. And so what that meant is that, like, we found ourselves in situations um, (laughs) and some of these minor league parks that just were not normal situations. And I think Jake knows the one that I I probably want to tell, but I don't know if there's any other uh, specific ones. I mean, I could go forever. Are you going to do the one in Arkansas? Uh, Yes. Yes. In Arkansas. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Multiple Ar- multiple weird Arkansas stories, but yes, um, this was two th- 2005. Uh, what year was this? Was this the Texas trip or was this 14. the 16? 14. 14. Okay. Um, so we were seeing the Texas Rangers uh, minor league affiliate on the road, I believe, right? This was, I believe Frisco was on the road and one you Darvish was making a rehab start. Now, rehab starts, first of all, don't normally happen on the road, so it was already strange, but the tone was set early on when the- In the parking uh, lot. In in the parking lot and the press box of the Northwest Arkansas Naturals, I believe, um, when it was just Jake and I and like 10 members of the Japanese media. At least. At least, like maybe 15. Again, at, at these press boxes are not meant for this, <laughs> for these kind of things. So that was already like, this is hilarious. The, you know, they're, they're here to watch you Darvish throw like 30 pitches and, you know, get out of here as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. And so he does that. And the way these rehab starts work is they, they do, you know, the, the, the pitcher, he, he makes a start. And then during the game, they make the guy available because they're, he's the most important thing happening. And so they're not going to wait until the end of the game to make the player available because he wants to just leave. Right. And so you Darvish throws his two innings and we're sitting in the press box with the 15 Japanese media members. And, and they say, all right, you Darvish will be available downstairs in five minutes or something like that. We're like, great. Oh, I guess like, we got to check this out. <laughs> like looking down at our, you know, our goofy credentials. We're like, oh, I guess we'll go see what this is like. So we, and again, we're like 20, right? Whatever, 19. So we go down. I was 18 and you yes. were 19. So we go down and at this minor, specific minor league park, there's no media room. There's no big press conference room. There's no podium, right? They basically just set up like a like a background banner to show you that like where you are and they just have like a designated space. But this designated space was in the closet where they keep all the minor league props. Okay, so if you've been to a minor league game, you know, they have like the bouncy horse and the little go karts and like all these like weird costumes and whatever. Right. And so (laughs) we are just in this room. I'm literally like sitting on one of these bouncy horses waiting for you Darvish to come down and talk to the Japanese media. And Jake and I are just looking at each other, like, like could not stop laughing at the situation because at this point too, like we hadn't, th- this is long before we had really interacted with any, we'd never been in a scrum. Like we yeah, had we, never we, done, this was our first scrum. Right. And, and we'd never had any sort of interaction with like famous major league players. I'm like, you Darvish at this time, he still is this, was an international phenomenon, right? Like he mm-hmm. was a huge, huge, huge deal. And as we were sitting there amongst these toys waiting for you Darvish to show up, it was just like the, what if, what is this? Where are we? Why, what is this life that we have chosen? And it's that like one just prop, sticks with me. <laughs> I'm in a prop closet in Fayetteville, Arkansas. With yeah. 15 members of the Japanese media mm-hmm. about to interview a six. That was the other thing I remember. That guy is enormous. You know, <laughs> yes. yes. that guy yes. is huge. And he walks in and he, I just like, there's him. I, I had a video of it somewhere. The video, it's like me panning from Darvish to Jordan on like the inflatable, you know, bouncy horse. And for whatever reason, <sighs> you Darvish in the minor league prop closet has just, embedded itself in our minds forever <laughs> um i think i would have wanted to mess with the props so yes. i oh i did understand did you really 
Oh yeah. Oh, I remember great. Jordan at one point. Cause I, I remember being really caffeinated that day. And at one point Jordan was like, you need to chill. Did you have six <laughs> Red Bulls or monsters that day? It was, no, I'm not it was, Tommy it was dicey. It was uh, that I just imagined, well, let's just say that behavior would not be tolerated in the Yankees clubhouse. <laughs> Uh, you guys are so funny. I'm trying to think um, if we have any other any other good ones. I, I'm I mean, sure like, we do, but we'll we'll we I mean, yeah. that yeah, we'll let that one stand on its own. Before I jump to questions, and by the way, if you have questions, you can throw them in the chat now. Before I jump to their questions, I want to ask about college baseball. So I am not a big college baseball watcher. How would someone like me get into college baseball and like because you guys post the names love the names i love when you remember some guys um so how would how how would a non-casual just complete completely unaware of college baseball situation how would i get into it it's on turn it on it's no like right now the like spring training games don't matter right Mm -hmm. and i really struggle to watch spring training i can't do it it just doesn't feel real what I love about college baseball and college athletics is how much it, it means to people. And I know this is kind of a cliche, like, the oh, it means more to them. But, you know, so many of these players know that this is it, right? They're not going to make a living off of the sport that they play. And like mm-hmm. that, we could have a longer conversation about, you know, the NCAA and how it takes advantage of, of people in, in mostly football and basketball, but baseball, maybe a little bit, whatever. And so when you have like seniors, and this is true in like March Madness, right? When you have seniors who are not just staring down the end of a season or a game, but the end of a career and the end of a childhood, that is what I always think about, right? Because when I had lost my last game in college sports, I had to be an adult. I was done with, with childhood, right? And so for me, that type of pressure and this, those stakes, for me, like, they seem really high. Now, as someone mm-hmm. who has not experienced that, I understand how, like, you watch college baseball, you're like, this is a worse version of the thing that's on TV. You know what I mean? I mean, when I do watch it, I enjoy it. I really right. do. But it is worse. I totally, like, I totally sympathize with that. I had an old, I had a roommate when I first moved to New York who was a soccer player, and he didn't like baseball mm-hmm. very much. But he loved college baseball. And the way he described it was this. When the ball's put in play, I have no idea what's going to happen. In the big leagues, guy hits the ball and play. It plays over, usually. It's usually an outer right. double or whatever. College baseball, you got guys screwing up every which way, you yeah. know? And so and, that does create a more unpredictable experience. And I mean, okay. literally, like, the game I just watched last night was just, like, Florida State-Jacksonville. And oh. again, it's a guy, first and third, you know, they're down by one. And it's two outs and a guy pops one up and you think, okay, well, the game's over. Oh, nope. There was like a bizarre drop collision. And the guy on first comes all the way around for a walk-off. And like those things are happening all the time. And I know (laughs) you might hear that and think, oh, these guys just suck. But no, like college baseball as every level of baseball is getting better and better and better. You can still tune in and see college players throwing 95 miles an hour. Like that will still happen. I will also tell you, and maybe this will turn some of you off. The ball is juice like crazy this year. And there are a crazy number of homers. So if you like home runs, I would highly recommend turning into a D one game. The one thing I'm 2019, if 2019 was the best year of your life, then you should tune into college baseball. <laughs> yeah, if you want homers, man, this is this is the time for you. But the thing I, I would say too, and I think that a big part of it, and maybe maybe this is for you, maybe for people, is, is that it's kind of overwhelming because there's 300 teams, right? And you don't really know where to start. You might have some sense of, oh, well, probably the big schools that are good at the other sports are probably good at baseball. And that is, that is largely true. Um, but I would say that it, you should also think of it as, an opportunity to, to see so many different kinds of baseball from all with combinations of players from different parts of the country that are very different. And it, it is very different. And, and also just the, the bizarre, you know, we talk about how one of the best things in baseball is all the fields are different. There's just some weird stuff going on all the time, not just, you know, between the lines, but you're just going to see stuff that you, that you don't really expect. And, and I think the, the lack of, of, uh, 
polish, I think, is what makes it fun. Um, but there's also parts of it that, that aren't as fun, right? And and I know there's also pitch clock stuff in, in college now that is starting to speed the pace of play up there. But there is some of it that is objectively less less fun to watch. Uh, but I think that the, the, the amount of teams from all over the country and all these random matchups, especially midweek for teams coming down from oh. Maine to play in North Carolina and, oh, we got this team, so and so, like – that is just great because the regional stuff means so much more than it does uh, for the most part in, in professional baseball. And I think yeah. that element of it is really special as well. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump to everyone's questions. Thank you. I'm going to probably bug you guys on Twitter about college baseball now. Um, do it. Do you have girls on the teams you coach, Jake? Yes. So <laughs> uh, shouts, out to, shouts out to one of my favorites, Emmy. Uh, who is one of just the hard, the, one of the hardest chargers I, I have on my team. I would say on my travel team, we have one that's Emmy. And then in the Harlem little league, we have at the younger age groups, I would say in T like it, you, it goes down as kids age and, and sign up numbers go down as kids age, kids age anyway, like people drop it, but for girls, it's even more precipitous. Um, and a lot of that is, is like, if you're one girl and you're on a team with all guys, you're not going to be, a lot of those kids aren't comfortable. Like it happened to my little sister when she was playing baseball. And it happens to a lot of girls who were playing youth athletics around guys. Mm -hmm. Um, we do also have a softball program that starts at 10 and goes to 16. Um, but no, it, I would say that the number of girls in our league is lower than it should be but there are definitely girls who play. And like a big part of it is just making, again, no one's playing the big leagues. They just need to be enjoying themselves. And it's that simple. Um, this next question is also for you. Um, what were your impressions of Rob Thompson as a first time manager and one in the world series? Uh, okay. So Rob Thompson is unlike people that I've, like been around in my life he is so low energy in a in an endearing way like he he is he does funny. he does not drink five monsters that's not a thing mm -hmm. that he's doing mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe he should <laughs> he could he could wrap I would it up describe him as like if you've ever taken an expensive yoga class and at the end they have like the bowl that is just one tone, but it's great. You know, that's Rob Thompson. That's how I describe Rob Thompson. Steady. The players love that dude. And a big reason not to throw shade on Joe Girardi, but it's that Rob Thompson is the antithesis of Joe Girardi. <laughs> and Joe Girardi was basically like a hard ass in that locker room and was on players all the time and was too involved. And mm -hmm. Rob Thompson came in and was like, you guys have a good time. I'll be in this other room. Get me if you need me. Right. And that really endeared himself to a lot of those players. I like Rob Thompson a lot. He's certainly not like someone I would ever like become friends with in, in the wild for lack of a better term, but, but I like him. Jordan, do you have anything on, on, on Tom? No, I, I think it's what you just said. Like, Clearly that worked because talent was never the question for the Phillies. <laughs> it was just like, let's just get out of the way and let these dudes ball. And that clearly worked for them. So our next question is for you, Jordan. Um, what made you a Seattle Mariners and Felix Fernandez fan? Yeah. So I, I mentioned, I got my, my, my K towel here. Um, lucky enough to, to sit in a game uh, in the Kings court back in 2015. I mean, yeah, he was, he was just captivating, you know, in the same way that Bryce was like, I wasn't a Nationals fan. Um, they were bad and really lame when they showed up in so DC. Lame. And so, so I didn't, they did not kind of capture me. Um, they, they weirdly have more recently, you know, obviously with the 2019 run and my family's Nationals fans. But for me, it was really just like, I was fascinated by the Mariners as this team with this drought. And Felix was just this, this singular event that, didn't there was not really much like that in sports um or certainly in baseball where it was like yeah like this team sucks but you're tuning in for this guy every five days and that was so cool and, and the perfect game was was just a big part of that and i got I found myself you know really involved in the, the lookout landing community and reading jeff sullivan and all those 
all those great people. And um, yeah, that was, that was kind of how it started. I also really liked, like when I started getting MLB TV, you know, in high school, I loved staying up for the late games. Like love, Jordan love, love that. Jordan was an insomnia. Like you, yeah, I was never, you slept I was, less in high school than anyone I ever knew. Yeah, yeah. Like I was just up just watching games every, and I, I loved having those West coast games to the point where now I cannot stand being on the West coast and not having a game on after 10 o'clock like that sucks so much and when like <laughs> when like Mets fans and Yankees fans like when they do a West Coast swing they're like oh I gotta stay up and watch the oh the Mets don't start until 10 I'm like are you kidding me like this is the best like this is you can do like oh it's just it's just so much better so um so yeah that that's really kind of how they how they got me and then you know it paid off because now they're pretty good but it took a while but now they're pretty good <laughs> Um, I knew someone was going to ask this, so I didn't ask it earlier because I know, but how did you guys come up with the name? Mm. Yes. You know, I've actually been, been thinking about this more as the, uh, the world baseball classic is starting next week and one Yoana Cespedes now 11 years removed from his, uh, amazing rookie season will be suiting up for team Cuba over in the, I believe the Taiwan, uh, pool anyway. So as we mentioned, we were total dorks in high school. And when uh, Cespedes came over, um, he made a video that was amazing. And normally when international prospects come over, maybe there's a little clips. Oh, hey, look, I'm playing baseball. Here's me taking BP. Here's me throwing baseballs, whatever. It's like three minutes and they look great. Uh, his was that, but plus 15 minutes of slow-mo shirtless running and a bunch of random stuff where, you know, he's dancing with his mom and he's doing X, Y, Z. And then at the very end, he's, he's roasting an entire pig on a spit um, and with his family at his birthday, which we've since learned. And uh, it's amazing. And we were like, wow, this is so funny that he sent this to all the teams and all the teams were like, we love this. You're great. Here are the A's gave him a million, millions and millions of dollars. So yeah, we were like, oh, Cespedes Australian Barbecue. That's what this was. We wanted to honor this amazing player and this hilarious thing that he uh, decided to include in his highlight reel. And uh, at that point, we were like, oh, so we'll probably have to explain this to our grandparents. And then that'll be it. And so that'll, that'll be cool. And now we explain maybe it. Ben, uh, maybe, every ben, maybe Ben Starin. <laughs> yeah, ben maybe our, our friends in middle school. Uh, but instead, we explain it, you know, uh, multiple times a week to many people. It's it this happens this, all the time. This happens yeah. like in major league dugouts all the time. Where like we'll do an interview, really? the person doesn't even know who. Like we don't think they have an idea who we are, and then they'll like start walking away, and they'll turn like, "So what's the deal with the name?" I'm like, oh, um, well, since you asked, you know, let me let me tell you. <laughs> the one that's embedded in my mind is like, okay, so. Last year during the Phillies run, I had developed a relationship with Kyle Schwarber, who I had never met before that run. I had talked to him once or twice, but nothing serious. And, you know, during this run, I, I basically came back to him for quotes whenever I needed quotes, right? And, and we kind of developed a relationship. He knew I wrote for Fox Sports, or I, I knew he knew I wrote for Fox Sports, whatever. But we never had made the Cespedes Friendly Barbecue connection. After the Phillies get no hit in game four of the World Series, I'm in the locker room talking to Schwarber like, about like, yo, the no hitter or this and that. And then I start walking to me, he goes, Hey, what's the deal with the name? Why is Cespedes is feeling barbecue? I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. Like, why'd you guys name it that? I'm like, Kyle Schwarber, we're in the world series clubhouse after you got no hit. Like, and you're concerned about why I, I named my blog something when I was like 17 years old. Really? Yeah. All right. So, sure. I'll explain it if you want. Which, but. which to that point is why it has been the best and worst name of all time. Yeah. Uh, because we have to explain it every possible waking moment. And also it makes people be like, Hey, wait a minute. What the, what's going on over there? <laughs> and so, also, wait, so does that make me weird that I didn't, I did, I knew. And the, I no, that, I that just means that, by it. I, I honestly, I don't, I don't know what that means. It just, it, I, I like, yeah. I, I guess like for you, just since we've corresponded, I feel like you would have picked up on it at some point. So you didn't need to ask, mm -hmm. but I imagine there are some people listening to this like, why are yeah. they what is that and so well, super fair and we also got really fortunate with like Yoannis the player for multiple reasons we got so lucky mm -hmm. because one there was a period there where he was getting traded every year right <laughs> he got traded three times within I think like 18 months or something yeah and every time you get traded we would just get all those new fans of that fan base following us on Twitter <laughs> many of whom just thought we were Yoannis right and so like that was huge just you know for us but then like he became or already was 
this emblem, this beautiful kind of um, example of don't give a crap baseball joy. Where like he was showing up to spring training on a horse, right? Like, <laughs> or in a different car named for five straight days. <laughs> in the car, like what are the odds that we named our whole thing after a player who would show up to spring training on a horse, right? <laughs> think about that. Think about how- But it's how, super fitting. It's super yeah. fitting. That's what I'm saying. Like it, but, if you had to think about any like goofy, dumb baseball thing that exemplifies like what we love about the game, it would be showing up to spring training on a horse. And just by but, total random chance, I don't really believe in the power above right now, uh, but that makes like, why did we end up with that guy? But, but that's Weird. the thing. It, and like, that's, there's so many things throughout his career, the multiple home run derbies, the carrying the Mets to the world series, and then botching a play in the world series in a way that like, this has never been done before where he kicks a ball and it's an inside the park home run. Smoking a cigar <laughs> in the Mets dugout in the NLCS before they got the last out. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, like there was that, and then there was when his his chain exploded on the field, and they were picking up the diamonds, and his all of his that. weird injuries, where he was attacked by a boar, and he was, and then like, I mean, to to put it like, and, and then obviously it's okay because it's he's okay now. At the time, it was terrifying. The dude just dipped on his team in the middle of the season and didn't tell anybody. Remember the Mets like put out, they're like, we don't know where he is. And like, that was terrifying at the time. I mean, now we can sort of laugh about it, but like the level of unpredictability with him throughout the career on top of the fact that like, I almost lost in it. in the fact that at his peak, he was one of the best players in the league um, yeah. is just it exemplifies so much. And like, like Jake said, like we just got crazy, crazy, crazy lucky. Sure. We did pick him because that first inkling was like, this dude's a little different, but at the same time, uh, we know how lucky we've gotten. And the fact that I know he hasn't played in MLB for a while now, but the fact that he's still playing baseball, got to watch him in winter ball a little bit this past winter, and that he's going to play for Cuba. Like that Cuba's the first game next week, Tuesday, 11 PM Eastern. I'm going to be locked in for his at bat. Uh, no doubt. I'm, I'm excited. And like and um, explaining it to people, right? Like yeah. it, it wasn't notable that he roasted the pig. Yes. Right. It wasn't notable that he filmed himself roasting the pig. It was notable that he thought that the video of him roasting the pig was worth sending to all 30 major league general managers. And it worked. It It was. And it worked. It was. And Billy Bean saw it and was like, 36 million. (laughs) Okay, this is our last question. Um, I knew you were going to get a prediction question, which is why I warned you. Um, Who is the next baseball superstar? Ooh, who is the next baseball superstar? You know, now we have so many young players that like, they're not even really, there's really no buildup. Like I'm a Mariners fan. Like Julio just kind of showed up. Julio Rodriguez just kind of showed up. It was just immediately the best. And so I feel like saying he's next is like, he's kind of there already. So I don't even really know if that's like a hot take. Um, I'm sure he can be even better. And I think he will be. Uh, But if we're picking someone that's like, maybe hasn't made the mate. I mean, I don't know. Does, does someone jump to mind for you, Jake, that maybe hasn't made the leap to, you know, a six win player, seven win player, or like, I don't know. What does anyone stand up for you? I was thinking about this on a different level. I was thinking like people that folks in the chat had never heard of before. Mm-hmm. Like I was thinking like completely off the board. Okay. My t- pick there would be Munitaka Murakami, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm who is a uh, power hitting first baseman playing in the NPB right now, who just hit 56 home runs, I think. Yeah. Uh, last yeah. year. And will be coming over to, um, to MLB in a couple of years. And it will be unfortunate for him to like have to, you know, he will be the best player like since Otani probably when he comes over and he'll have to be in that shadow, which is impossible because it's Otani. Um, but that's someone that I'm really excited to see who like hasn't, burst onto our scene yet anything from like the amateur ranks or like i mean if we're talking prospects like we could go on forever yeah yeah i mean there's look at any top prospect list there's there's some exciting guys that i'm sure will make an impact this year and and could be you know total you know impacts immediately i mean i'm just thinking in the college game like he's not personality wise definitely doesn't check it but like we just watched dylan cruz for a weekend (laughs) with LSU he's an LSU outfielder could be a you know maybe the number one pick in, in this year's draft I mean I've never seen someone just basically barrel every single pitch up for an entire weekend like Crazy. I know he wasn't necessarily facing the best pitch he's going to all season 
But as far as college players goes that I've seen recently, and it's always more fun to get excited about the high school guys because they're younger and, you know, they, it's, it's, you know, you have the fun facts of, oh my God, he's, he's 19 or he's 18. And it's not quite the same when the college guys come up, but man, that guy is just so, so, so good. So good. But I'll echo the, the Murakami shout out and we'll, we'll hear a lot about him during the world baseball classic as well. Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys for taking the time out to chat with me. This has been super fun as I expected. Um, and I want to say to everyone else, thanks for joining. I hope you'll join me next month when I'll be talking with Clinton Yates of ESPN. Thanks again. Yeah. <laughs> we beat night, Clinton everyone. to the show. Let's go. <laughs> oh, we're going to hold that over him for a while. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everyone. Jake and Jordan don't hang up, but everyone else, thank you. Have a good night. I'll talk to you on Twitter.